All right, let's see if uh, we can uh, move forward with this a little bit. Um, see if we can go back to some things we may be able to agree on. All right, sir. All right. Uh, first thing is, is that the money you were stealing in addition to your income and the money you were borrowing was not just to pay for drugs. Would you agree with that? Sure. All right. And would you agree that your stealing, in addition to the money you were borrowing, increased over the years as we moved towards June of 2021? Repeat that, please, sir. Sure. Would you agree that your stealing increased over the years as we moved towards June of 2021? Yes, sir. And would you admit that your stealing increased, in particular, after the boat wreck? Uh, no, sir, I, I don't agree with that. You I mean, don't agree with that? I, I think I continued to do it, but I, I, I don't, as I sit here today, I, I, I don't think I took more money that I should not have taken after the boat wreck than I did before the boat wreck. Okay. But again, the, the, those documents speak for themselves, Mr. Waters, and if mm -hmm. that's the case, then that's the case. But as we sit here, I, I, I think that I probably wrongly took from clients and people that trusted me more, as much money before that boat wreck as after. And I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to get through this so we don't get bogged down like we did yesterday, all right? Uh, I understand. All right. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't agree with me that in 2019 alone you stole about $3.7 million? No, I, th I think that's correct. All right. And you would, would you agree with me, though, that that figure in 2019 was generally higher than any other year that you've been stealing since 2011? In any year, sure, I'd agree with that. Okay. I thought you were talking about overall the whole, you know, the whole cycle. But right. yeah, I, I I would agree that in 2019 I stole more money than any other year. Would you agree with me that from 2015 on, your legitimate income, while still very strong, was diminishing, as a general matter? Well, I think whatever my income is speaks for itself. But as a general rule, a plaintiff's lawyer doing what we do, income ebbs and flows. Some, you have some really good years. You have some really lean years. And no, I, 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 think, I, had some, I think I had some good years. Maybe not the, you know, four and five million dollar years, but I think I had some two and three million dollar years in there. And, and my caseload was such that, you know, I had one of the things I was working on that Monday was one of the biggest cases that I've ever been involved in. And Talking about the Dominion case, right? Yes, sir. All right. And so, you know, I think it was cyclical. I think it, so I don't, I don't without looking at the record specifically, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Okay, so you don't remember then? No, I do remember. I, I, I don't think I agree with that. But again, those records will speak for themselves. Um, okay. All right. So would you agree with me that in 2014, uh, your reported income was over a million dollars? Objection relevant. Objection is overruled. Re reported income, like mm -hmm. tax-wise or reported? Yeah. I assume you have a document that says that, and if you're reading that from a document, I don't dispute it. I mean, I'm happy to show it to you if you like. I trust you, Mr. Waters. So. All right, I appreciate that. All right, 2015, uh, would you agree that your reported income was over $2 million? Again, I, I, I don't dispute that. All right. 2016, reported income, $900,000. Okay. 2017, reported income, $218,000. Okay. 2018 reported income of $749,000, roughly. Okay. And 2019 
reported income of six hundred fifty-five thousand dollars. Okay, and see that that I mean to me that demonstrates exactly what I'm talking about how it goes up and down. And would you agree with me that though during those periods of time where you were making that kind of money, you continued to steal? And I think you've already said that your stealing increased as we move through those years, as a general matter. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't dispute, and I, I have never disputed since I was confronted on Labor Day weekend right. that I took money from my clients. We, we've gone through that. And I well, think but you keep asking that. me I'm about asking that. I'm asking you if, it, if, it, you're, if you're income. Uh, you can finish your answer. So the, the, the point is, is I have never since being confronted that day my brother and my partner came to talk to me that I have stolen money that did not belong to me, that I misled people to do it, people that I cared about, still care about, um, a lot of them that I love and still love, And I misled them to do it, and I was wrong. I, I have never disputed that from day one. I, and I, we've been through that. All I'm trying to establish right now with you, Mr. Murdoch, is as we move towards June of 2021, what your con financial condition was like, okay? I've, I agree you've testified to that multiple times, all right? So let me ask you this. During this time that your income was what we just went through and you conceded that your stealing was increasing, were you also borrowing significant amount of money from Palmetto State Bank? Uh, yes, I'd always borrowed significant amount of money from Palmetto State Bank, or, or for the last, more than the last decade. Right. So yes, sir, I agree with that. Yeah, but we, as we moved to June of 2021, did you have a million dollar line of credit with the bank that was pretty much maxed out? Yes or no? In, in As we moved to June of 2021. So in June of 21? Sure. Yes. All right. And did you also have a $600,000 line of credit that was pretty much maxed out around that time? I did. All right. And did you also, over the years, repeatedly borrow six figures from your law partners? Well, I borrowed money from a law partner. Which one? Johnny Parker. Johnny Parker. Okay. And... That was a fairly common occurrence over the years. It happened multiple times. Would you agree with that? I agree that it happened multiple times. All right. And you would agree also that you would sometimes use some of the stolen money to pay that back? I, I, I won't dispute that. I don't know that that's the case. I, I know what I saw Mr. Um, Bernie testify to in using that particular accounting method you know, I, I see that. All right. So I, I, I don't dispute that. All right. And would you agree that you also, when you needed money, occasionally borrow as much as five and six figures from your father, Mr. Randolph? I did. All right. And would you also agree that over the years, particularly as we moved to June of 2021, you would use stolen money to pay that back? I don't dispute that. Okay. If, if that's what the record shows. <clears throat> All right, and you, you just mentioned here in the testimony of Carson Burney and the banker and all that, you would agree with me that as we move to June of 2021, at least in liquid funds, you were running out of money. In liquid funds is in money on hand or money that I could get? Money that you could, liquid funds. You're a lawyer, you know what liquid means. Where are you well, running I, out I don't money? know what you mean by liquid, okay. Mr. Waters, and so. Money you could readily access assets that you could readily access to pay your ever-increasing debts. No, sir, I don't agree with that. You don't agree with that? I do not agree with okay. that, and I'll tell you why. All right. In, in, so are, are we talking about June? I'm talking about as we move to June. Okay, but what time period are you talking about? All right, let's talk about January From, to June. Okay, January to June. January to June, you know, I could borrow money from my father. Mm -hmm. I could borrow money from Johnny Parker. Mm -hmm. I could go to the bank and borrow money. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I had substantial equity in the Edisto house, right. as we've talked about. Which was in Maggie's name, correct? Well, it was in Maggie and my name. All right. So, you know, that definitely um, was, was in, in both of our names. Moselle was in Maggie's name. There was substantial equity in that that could have been barred against. So under the, under the terms as you defined liquid assets just now, money that I would have access to, I disagree with okay. on that uh, uh, for those reasons that I just said. Can we at least agree that generally the way the compensation structure for legitimate money that you earned in your law firm, the vast majority of your compensation does not come except in one lump sum in December? Can we agree to that? Right. We get a salary. We, we would receive a salary. I believe our salary was $125,000. Right. And then the income that was earned would be paid in the form of a bonus at the year end. All right. And then would you agree with me? that that is why you stole the Ferris fees in March of 2021 because you were in desperate need of funds and you could not wait till December to access those funds. I think there's probably a lot of reasons why I stole those funds, but I certainly would believe or, or don't dispute that that's one of the reasons. And would you agree with me that the $792,000 that you stole of those Ferris funds that you exhausted those within about two months? I don't know the time period, but I know that they, I know that I exhausted them. All right. Now again, I'm trying to get through this quickly because there's a lot more to talk about, obviously. But we went through a number of questions yesterday about the various clients that you stole from, correct? You remember that? Those cut the back and forth we had yesterday. Do you remember all that? Sure, I do. Okay. All right. And so I'm going to try to shortchange this, but I think it's important that we at least say the names of the people that were involved. But let's just do this to see if we can. To the comment, Your Honor, inappropriate. I'll rephrase, Your Honor. The clients that we're talking about, these are all real people, yes or no? They're all real people. All right. They're and all good clients, people. Okay. They're all people that I care about, that I cared about then. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are people that I love. Okay. And I did wrong by them. Yes, you hurt the people that you love, I know. So. <clears throat> Sustain. These were all people, every single one of them, that you at least had a personal conversation with at some point during the course of your representation. All of About my clients? The representation. Absolutely. I, I had multiple conversations with all of my clients. And these were people, every single one of them, real people that you looked in the eye and convinced them that everything was right. Thank you, Your Honor. 403, repetitive, cumulative. We spent two hours doing this yesterday. I'm just trying to sort of change the topic with simple questions that applies to everybody, and then I'm moving on. Proceed. I, I would have had conversations with all of my clients, and at some of the conversations would have been on the telephone. I would have had conversations where I might not be looking them in the eye. I would have had plenty of conversations where I did look them in the eye. All right. Every single one of them looked them in the eye at least once. Is that fair? Sure. Every single one of them. You look them in the eye and develop their trust in you. Is that true? Every client that I had, at some point, I, I looked them in the eye, and I believed that I had the trust of my clients. Whether that came from me looking them in the eye or not, I can't answer that. But I will agree with you that every single client, I looked them in the eye, and I believed that the people that I stole money from for all those years trusted me. And I'm going to show you what's been previously admitted as states 329, I believe it is, and 314. And I'm just going to ask you to peruse those spreadsheets really quickly. And once you have a chance to do that, let me know. I'll have one or two questions. 
about that? All right, so I'm sorry. What was your question? I just asked you to look at them. Have you had a chance to review those documents? I have. All right. And would you agree with me that every single name on here are either clients that trusted you that you stole from or instances in which you stole from your law partners who trusted you as well? I agree with that. All right. So we don't need to go through each, each one of these, correct? I agree with that. Mr. Waters, like I've told you, I'll go through whatever you want to go through, but each one of those clients is just what we've already talked about. Good people, fine people, upstanding people, they trusted me. Every single one of them, I did, and I do still care about, and many of them I love and consider them close friends. Like Barrett Bulware? Absolutely. It's a perfect example. And you stole from Barrett Boer. I did. You recall a conversation that you had with Ronnie Crosby in which he told you that Barrett was desperate for money because he needed his wife to stay in a hotel near him while he was undergoing treatment for terminal cancer around the time that you stole from him. Hey, you're on. Jackson's overruled. I don't recall that conversation, but you know, I, I knew Barrett was sick. That you know, Barrett is a unique situation. I mean, Barrett, Barrett is and was um, dear to me as a friend. But I mean, Barrett and I had a long, long history. You know. I guess really, and I lied probably more by omission, lies by omission in stealing that money. Um, but that's a perfect example. You keep asking about me having these conversations and looking people in the eye. I mean, that's a perfect example. I mean, when I stole that money, he was nowhere around. It was more based on lies by omission. And, and Barrett and I had such a history these real estate deals that you're asking me about. Barrett was one of my good friends and we had been in these real estate deals together. Barrett was just an interesting person. He was a shrimper. He was born and raised in Allendale County. And, and he moved down to the coast. And Mr. Murdoch. As shrimping. Mr. Murdoch, I, I don't well, know that we need Barrett's entire life story. No, I, but it's, it's important but to understand this based this. on the question you asked. I don't think his entire life story is responsible, Your Honor. And I'm not intending to give his life story. I'm just telling you a little background. Go so ahead. Tell us about it. your friend that you stole from. That's fine. So Barrett started, started getting into real estate, and he was really good at it. And, and so I started getting involved with him in that. He could go out and find pieces of property that were really cheap, get them and sell them, and, and, and make money. Well, we got in some of these deals, and we got in as Barrett and it was some other people. Well. When the recession hit, one of the reasons these land deals caused me trouble is because the people that I was in these deals with no longer could pay. Where, whereas I might have gone in and I was a 20% person, I'm now all of a sudden, either I have to default at the bank and, and, and affect credit, affect the ability to borrow, or I have to pay 100%. And so that's what I did. I paid 100%. And so there were years where I was paying instead of a fifth or a half, I'm paying the whole thing. And it equated to hundreds of thousands, it equated to millions of dollars, which is one of the ways why I ended up with the Moselle property, because I had paid more than a million dollars in monies for, for, for Barrett, and that was part of the, tr the deal and the trade in, in me purchasing Moselle. So what you're and telling me is you felt like you were entitled to steal from him. No, no. Uh, you know what? I, 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 I will t tell you this, that, you know, 
when you're doing the things wrong that I was doing, you have all kind of ways of justifying it. And, and, and I'm not saying that that makes it right by any means because it's not. It's wrong. I've said that a hundred times. But when I was doing it and I was as addicted as I was and the things I was doing, there's all kind of things that you, you know, to, to be able to look yourself in the mirror, uh, you lie to yourself. And I guess self-justification for these bad things, you know, I guess is what I was doing. But, you know, Barrett had owed me so much money that when I took his money, I, I just didn't tell him. So it, it, was, it was a lie by omission. All right. All these people on these two exhibits, these were real people that needed this money, is that correct? I'm sure they did. But it was more important to you that you stole their money on top of the 40% of legal fees that you were taking. Repetitive. I've never I, that question. I stole their money. It was more important to you than their needs, is that correct? Objection. Objections are ruled. I don't remember sitting down and calculating, okay, is this more important? You know, one of the self-justifications that I talked about, Mr. Waters, is, and, and this is one of the things, again, I want to make it clear. I, I don't, as I sit here today, I do not believe that any of this justifications that I'm talking about made any of this okay, because I don't. I've, I've owned up to all this money I stole. I've tried to since I was confronted, and I continue here today. But one of the justifications at the time when I was taking pills and doing the things I was doing was I may ask a partner, okay, how much is this case worth? And if, if, if one of my partners, and I may not even give them all the real facts, okay? So if they said this case is worth $100,000, okay, and I go out and I get them $300,000, you know, that's one of the st stupid little things. Okay, well, this isn't the same. And that's one of those justifications that I used in looking back on this that I don't know how I did. But so to sit down and say, did I evaluate that they needed the money more than I did? I, I, you know, I don't think I did that. I think I was selfish, and I, I, I think I just took the money. Okay. I think I understand. Um, I asked you a series of questions yesterday about at least relating one conversation you had with one of these clients. And I'm just going to ask you this one. Do you remember looking Tony Satterfield in the eye and lying to him? I remember lying to Tony Satterfield, and I remember looking him in the eye on many occasions. And lying to him? Yeah. Okay. Lying to his family? I lied to his family. I don't know if I did it in person, but I know I had phone conversations with him where I lied to him. Okay. Let's talk a little bit uh, about the pills, if we can. Okay. Um, and You've already testified, as have other people, that you were still able to function as a lawyer over the years despite the pills that you were using. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you were able, of course, during this period of time to engage in these relatively complicated thefts that increased over the years that we've just talked about, despite the pill usage. Is that correct? I was. Hmm? I was. All right. And you were also able to, during this time period, convince your staff that nothing was amiss with all of these exhibits, despite your pill usage. I mean, most of those didn't require m convincing my staff. But just so we're on the same page again, I acknowledge that I certainly 
allowed them to be misled. I certainly allowed them to do things that I shouldn't have done on my behalf, knowing that they trusted me. How many, uh, how many pills were you using a day? Depends on um, a number of items. Most, most importantly, how strong the pill was. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about, let's say start maybe in January of 2021 and move forward. Can you describe to the jury what your daily pill intake was like? I think at that time, most of what I was purchasing was 30 uh, milligram pills, um, instant release, oxycodone. Um, they were probably mixed in with some oxycontin, which is made of oxycodone. It's just time release. Um, I would have been taking Um, anywhere from fifteen uh, hundred milligrams, maybe, to um, maybe maybe a, a, a thousand or, or maybe a thousand milligrams. Of, or, or 1,200 milligrams on a day I didn't take as much or didn't have as much up to, I mean, there are days, many days, a lot of days, most days were more than that, and many days would be, you know, 20, more than 2,000 milligrams a day. And how many pills is that? It, it depends on the strength mm. Well, let's say it's the 30s the pill. that you just mentioned. If I took 30, if, if, if I had 30 milligram pills, you, you figure 100 pills would be 3,000 milligrams. A hundred? A hundred. So you're taking 60 a day or something like that? I mean, there I, were days where I took more than that. There were days I took less than that. And how would you take them during the course of the day? I mean, how many are you taking at one time? How frequent in this time period, let's say January to June? You know, there's a point in time, and I'm not sure when it was. I think it was well before that where, and you have to understand this. This is something that I didn't, I mean, I can still remember the first time I ever took an oxy. Mr. Murdoch, can I ask you to answer my question, and I'll let you explain all you want. And my question was, I'm, how many were you taking a day during this time from January to June. Answer that first, please, and if you want to explain, I'm happy to let you do so. I'm not positive, and here's why. It's because over the years, like the, as I was saying, the first OxyContin, one OxyContin made me, literally made me sick. Um, and that was when I was transitioning from hydrocodone to oxycodone. And it, it made me sick because it was a really, really, really strong one. And so, you know, one OxyContin pill was like, 10 hydrocodone pills. So, but anyway, as I took more and more, and over the years, it just, you know, you build up a tolerance to pain pills. And so what might give me this energy, what, the, the reason, one of the reasons I became so addicted is, you know, some people talk about pain pills and how they make them lethargic and, you know, where they can't do anything and they feel, Opiates gave me energy. I mean, I, it, it, whatever I was doing, it made it more interesting. You know, it, it, it made me want to do it longer. Uh, you know, to go on a drive, it made driving, it just, it just, at the beginning, it made everything better. But I, I took so much just to keep, it got to a point where I was taking so much just to not backslide or go into withdrawals or have all those symptoms and so it, it got to the point where I was taking the amounts that I came to be taking in the time period you're talking about January to June 
So it, it, it evolved over time. It, it, it wasn't like it just started then, Mr. Waters. All right, can you just give me one, one example of a day during that time period? I mean, sure. I, so, I mean, does, did you take start at 8 o'clock in the morning or, you, or whatever time you got up and take one and then one every 30 minutes? I mean, well, no, uh, I, I've would, given you a chance to explain. So it would totally depend. It, it, it would totally depend on any number of circumstances. So in, starting a day, one of the main things that this would depend on was how late the day before I had taken pills and how many I had taken. And did I take them during the night? Did I wake up during the night and take them? So, you know, let's just say that it had been a while since I took any and I slept and I woke up, all right? Then I would immediately, immediately, first thing, take pills because if it's been a while a lot of times if you slept and hadn't taken pills you'd wake up and you could tell the beginnings of those I'm not gonna say they were really withdrawals but the agitation that you feel when you don't take it and you could tell it so you had to take it right away and so I would start off first thing I would do would take pills um. And that's how strong the withdrawals are for opiates, correct? That you feel that agitation until you can take another pill. It, yes, I mean, but that, I mean, that's just agitation's the tip of the iceberg um, when Let's it talk about that comes to withdrawals, sure. opiate withdrawals. I think you, you said in your what's been played for the jury and uh, the telephone conversation with Special Agent Kelly that and you talked about withdrawals, just how strong they are, how you're willing to do anything to make them stop, correct? I think what I said is almost anything. Almost anything. Well, describe that, please. I mean, you're sick. I mean, you're physically, you know, you are physically sick. You, um, it's like having the flu when you ache and you, your joints hurt. Um, you, you don't want to get up. I mean, you can't get up. And, and, and that's after a while. Uh, it, w it starts with what you're talking about, agitation, and, uh, you know, fidgety. Everybody talks about how fidgety I was. Um, but it, 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 it starts with, with that, and then it goes to, you know, you just, you might be sitting here and just all of a sudden sweat's running down your face all over your body. I mean, you so, like you ran a marathon. I mean, it, you literally sweat that much. Um, the next thing that comes on after about, uh, I don't know, 12 hours is, I call it jumpy legs, but I mean, you literally, I mean, you, you there, there's no way that you could sit right here in this chair. I mean, you, you, you couldn't, you, you couldn't remain sitting. I mean, you would have to get up and move around. And I mean, it's like your legs don't want to work. Um, and that lasts for about 20, anywhere from 18 to 24 hours. Um, during, during that period, the, uh, you know, the intestinal issues come in and I mean, you literally, you can't control yourself you have I mean, diarrhea like you have food poisoning um, you throw up um, I mean you're physically physically sick how many times did you try to self detox mr. waters dozens dozens if not hundreds, I, I, you know, it's so many, I, I can't tell you. And those, those symptoms you just described are extremely powerful and made it very difficult to do that. Is that correct? Made it difficult to? To try to self-detox. Oh, it's, it's, it's extremely hard. You mentioned yesterday uh, that you were paranoid. How long had that been going on? Well, no, I, I didn't say that I was paranoid. 
what I said was, as the addiction evolved, there would be situations where you would have these paranoid thoughts. And when and did those first start? I can't tell you when they first started, but. I mean, how long before June of 2021? Oh, a, a long week, time. A week, a month, a long time? Oh, no, time? no, 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 right. no. It was, you know, it was as my addiction got worse. I mean, it, it was a significant period of time, but, you know. How long when, did we have these paranoid thoughts? I, I, usually a matter of seconds. I mean, it, it was something, again, my whole life, you wouldn't see me where I didn't have pills on me. And, and I, that's where I kept them. I kept them on me because I, I was scared to put them somewhere for fear somebody would find them. So I kept them on me. So if you saw me, I had pills on me. I had a pocket full of pills on June the 8th, on June the 8th when, when I was sitting in, in uh, David Owen's patrol car. Um, so I always had them on me, and I might turn, I might be going to Edisto, and I turn on Hampton Street right out here, and a police car pulls out. Boom, I have paranoid thoughts. You know, it just, but I could always say, not doing, you're not doing anything wrong. He's not following you, and I, I can get past it in a matter of seconds. <clears throat> Did anybody in your family ever see you having these severe withdrawals? Absolutely. And who did? Mags, Paw Paw, Bus, my dad, Randy. John Marvin. And just to be clear, Randy and John Marvin never saw me having withdrawals before September. They so saw me. And I thank you for clarifying that. Prior to June of 2021, who in your family saw you having these severe withdrawals? Bus, Paw Paw, Maggie. My dad. Do you uh, remember in uh, calling? Remember calling Paul a little detective? I don't know that I ever called him a little detective, but I think Maggie did. I, I may have. I mean, Paul was very intuitive, so. I heard I Miriam. I heard your interviews. I heard Miriam call him a little detective. I know Maggie used to call him that. Did that have anything to do with the pills? Um. Well. Yeah, yeah, it had something to do with it. But I mean, Paul was always that way. But that that what led him to be called a little detective? Certainly, there were times when when. Um, Paul found pills. Including just a month before the murders. Is that correct? No, sir. All right. You recall 6-5-23 that was entered into evidence, which is a text from Paul to you? I did. Which he said that Maggie found pills in your bag? Right. Tell me about what but happened was, after that. You asked me about Paul finding them, but it was Maggie that found them. Fair enough. So it was Maggie that found them? Yes, sir. Okay. But Paul is the one who reached out to you, correct? On that occasion, yes, sir. Right. And what was the discussion after that? I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was about that I'd had eye surgery the, um, I don't know what day it was, but days before that, the day Maggie found them, Maggie drove me to the doctor for me to have my cataract um, um, removed, whatever, late, whatever they call that surgery, I can't remember, but I had a cataract taken out, outpatient. You go in for a couple hours and you come out. And 
it was during COVID, and so Maggie wasn't allowed to come into the doctor's office, and so she sat in the car. And I had left pills in the computer bag, and sitting out there bored, I guess she started looking at my computer and found them in the computer bag. So she found um, those pills. All right, and so she obviously told Paul, and Paul texted you, correct, about finding those pills? That's correct. In May of 2021? That's correct. And you've heard your sister-in-law, Marion, testify that Maggie called him the little detective about the pills. You heard that testimony in this courtroom? I did hear that. All right. So did they start to watch you like a hawk and get on you about your pill usage during the month of May? No. They did not? No. Mr. Waters, this battle that I had with addiction, it had been going on for years, years. And so they had been watching me like a hawk for years um, before May. May was just one occurrence where I let them down again. They had been watching like a hawk for years, is that correct? About my pill addiction, yes, sir. That is correct. Uh, this time in May, that wasn't the only time that Paul found pills or Maggie found pills. Is that correct? Now, there were a number of times where Mags found pills, Paul Paul found pills, Bus found pills. I mean, it was an ongoing, it was just an ongoing battle for me. And after they found those pills in May, that being Maggie and Paul, were they trying to get you to self-detox? No, sir, not at that point in time. They just let it go? No, they didn't let it go. But at that point in time, Paul Paul and I had already had a discussion based on um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but there had been a previous occasion a good while back where there had been a previous occasion where either Maggie or Paul had found pills, and Paul had come to me and asked me and I told him, you know, I was back on the pills. Um, and We had had a long talk. I, I, as I said, I don't remember exactly when it was before that. Paul and I had had a long talk. And we had agreed, I, I had agreed, and I detoxed so many times. I'd been to detox. I detoxed at home with Maggie's help. I detoxed at home with <coughs> doctor's help. I detoxed on my own, tried to, and, and it, it just, it just detoxing just didn't work. It just, you couldn't, you could detox, but you couldn't, no, not you, I couldn't. I couldn't stay off of them. And so, I promised Paul That as soon as his, 
as soon as we finished with his criminal case, that I would go to rehab. And um, and on this particular occasion, um, Paul knew that his mom worried about me so much with pills that on this particular occasion, I think that Paul Paul convinced Maggie that I got those pills in anticipation of the eye surgery, but that I never took them so that she would not worry that I was once again. So you're talking about, now you're claiming that about the time in May, that, that Paul talked to Maggie and convinced her of that? Or are you talking about a different time? I'm not claiming that, Mr. Waters. That's a fact. This is okay. what happened. All right. We're, we're hearing that now, correct? Hearing what now? What you just said. Well, you just asked me this. Mr. Ward, if you keep making an issue about the first time I, you hearing these things, when, when I got arrested and I went to jail, we began reaching out to you to talk to you about all of these things, to try to tell you everything that I had done, to give you all these details, to help y'all go through these financial things. And up until the time that y'all charged me with murdering my wife and child, you would never uh, give Jim Griffin a response to our invitations to sit down and meet with you. So you're telling so, me I never responded to Jim Griffin? Is that what you're saying here today? I'm telling you. Are you saying that you ever before yesterday reached out to anyone through yourself or through your attorneys and reached out to anyone in law enforcement or the prosecution and told them the story about the kennels? Are you telling me that? I'm, what I'm Did telling you, you answer my Mr. question Waters? first, please, sir. Answer my question first. Did you ever reach out to anyone in law enforcement or the prosecution and tell that story that you told this jury yesterday about the kennels before yesterday? Did I ever reach out to law enforcement you, to say, I want to tell you about the kennels? No, sir, I did not. What this I, is the Fifth Amendment line. Pardon? This questioning about him volunteering information on these charges violates his Fifth Amendment rights, and we strongly object. Any more, would we have to make a motion. He brought it up. Objections overruled. What I did was so. Answer yep. my question first, sir. Yeah, for the record, he did not bring it. He was talking about financial stuff. Down, Mr. Um, he was Griffin. Yes or no question. Before yesterday, did you ever bring up what you told this jury about that kennels? To anybody in the prosecution or anybody in law enforcement? No, I, I didn't have the opportunity to, Mr. Waters, because you would not respond to my invitations to reach out and tell you about all the things that I'd done wrong. And to talk about bringing this to a head, to talk about bringing this to closure. I understand how many people I hurt. I understand. Um, how angry my partners are and how hurt they are. And I understand how hurt these people that I stole money from are. I understand how hurt they are. And one of the things that I believe is getting past this may help them get some closure. And so since at least January, I've been trying to sit down with y'all to talk to y'all. Okay. And never, never, ever got a response to the multiple requests. Multiple requests? Yes, sir. <laughs> multiple requests. I, I, I would ask about right, this Mr. Let's, every uh, well, let's few ask weeks. this, sir. Sir? Did Mark Ball ever hear your story to the jury about the kennels until yesterday? Your buddy and law partner, Mark Ball? No, sir. I haven't spoken to Mark Ball since I went to rehab. And these were the same law partners that you were listening to the night of. Is that, is that what you testified to this jury earlier? You testified to that earlier, did you not? 
I, I don't understand your question. Didn't you testify earlier that you were listening to your law partners on the night of the incident? Did, was I listening to them? Yeah, you testified to that. It's a simple question, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I was. It, when are you talking about? On June 8th, in the early morning hours. You testified to this jury that you were listening to them, but you never told them the Kendall story either, and they heard it for the first time yesterday as well. Isn't that correct? Y yes, that's the first time they heard it. First time that Ronnie Crosby ever heard that would have been yesterday? If he was listening, that would have been the first time he first heard it. First time Johnny Parker ever heard that was yesterday? Yes. First time Danny Henderson, who was representing you in the boat case, ever heard that was yesterday? Yes, yesterday is the first time that I have said that openly. But that, that's not what you were asking me, Mr. Waters, but you, you go ahead. First time your brother Randy heard that was yesterday. If he was listening. <clears throat> And Mr. Waters, just to be clear, I was begging for a meeting with y'all to try to bring this to a close, to, to talk to y'all about everything up until the time that y'all charged me with hurting Maggie and Paul. Now, at, after that point in time, uh, I, I stopped, You're obviously. You're that you were begging for a meeting, and and you, but you admit information was never conveyed that you wanted to change your story after multiple interviews with law enforcement about what happened that night, including the most important fact of all, which is when the last time you supposedly saw your wife and son alive was. I don't know exactly what was conveyed or not because to you because I wasn't part of it. All I know Fair is enough. what you don't I was trying to do was to sit down. I understood to bring all this to a close that y'all would want me to sit down and go through all of these financial things, all of these things that I'd done wrong, and to try to bring that to a close, I was repeatedly trying to sit down with y'all. The reality is, Mr. Murdoch, is the reason why no one's ever heard that before is because you had to sit in this courtroom and hear your family and your friends, one after the other, come in and testify that you were on that kennel video. So you, like you've done so many times over the course of your life, had to back up and make a new story that kind of fit with the facts that can't be denied. Isn't that true, sir? No, sir, that's not true. Okay. You've done that over and over again over the years with all of this that we've been talking about, haven't you? I've done what over and over again? The second that you're confronted with facts that you can't deny, you immediately come up with a new lie. Isn't that correct? Mr. Waters, have we established I have lied many times, but I can't sit here and tell you that, you, what are you talking about, facts that I can't deny? That I, I, I would disagree with that proposition that you're putting out, that that was what I did all the time. But in, in doing that, I admit again that I have lied to people that trusted me. So we can agree that the prosecution and law enforcement and so many of your friends and family heard for the first time your story about the kennels yesterday after all these weeks of testimony. Can we agree on that? That law enforcement, mm -hmm. my partners, and my friends heard me say that for the first time. Yes, I agree with that. Would you agree with me? that your own lawyer was repeating your story that you were at home napping as late as November of 22 on national television. 
I don't I don't know. I, you don't know that. No, nah, in jail, we don't we don't get newspapers, and the, the TV we have is limited. So, so your own lawyers, at least as late as November 22, didn't know the story that you've told to this jury after five weeks of your family and friends coming in and saying, "Yeah, that's him on that video." Uh, I don't objection, know. your honor, violates attorney-client privilege communication. Totally improper. Yes, totally improper. Yes, sir. Response. He uh, has brought up his communications with counsel, and now I, that is fair game, your honor. Communications through counsel with or alleged communications with the prosecution. He didn't. There's, there's no attorney client privilege to national television interviews. The objection is overruled. Are you waiting for me to answer, Mr. Waters, or did I answer? Uh, I, I think the point's made. All right, sir. You, you said you were unaware of that national television interview. Is that what you said? You unaware, unaware of what national television interview? The one where your lawyer repeated that story as late as November of 2022. Your story that you were actually home asleep at the house. The, the, only, the only national TV uh, ad that I'm aware of is, uh, not ad, program, is one um, that Mr. Griffin was involved in was a, are you referring to like a Dateline something? I'm talking about HBO. Okay, HBO. All right, like, so yeah, I, I, I am aware of that. And, and what I believe the case to be is that I believe that when that was in its works that Mr. Griffin made those statements sometime substantially before um, November of 22, as early as around the very beginning of 2021. Well, let's talk. Uh, at least what I understand to be the case. All right, let's talk some more about your testimony from yesterday. And you're telling this jury, even on something as clear as a skin video, that your story doesn't change when you have to make them fit the facts that no longer can be denied. Is that what you're telling this jury? I don't understand that question. Say that again. I said, you're telling this jury that you don't change your story to make the facts fit evidence you can no longer deny, like what's been going on in this courtroom. I'm not telling the jury anything about that. All right, good. All right, let's move on. Let's talk some more about that issue. Um, let's talk about... The confrontation on June the 7th with Jeannie Seconder, which you said was no big deal. Isn't that what you testified? Words to that effect? I, I, I think what I testified to is that to me, it certainly didn't seem like a confrontation. Jeannie came to me and was almost apologetic. And this is what I believe, Mr. Waters, is I believe that what Jeannie Seconder and my partners have had to go through since September has been hard. I, I, I know they, I mean, I could see it. Um, I could see the hurt that I caused them. And, and I know that they're betrayed, and I know that they're angry, and I know that they're hurt. And I want to make clear to this that while I disagree with what Jeannie said as to it being a confrontation, because I don't believe that it was, I don't think that she was lying. I think that she feels it. I, I, th I think that, you know, she believes that that's the case after all this time that she's had to deal with this. But on June the 7th, when she came to me, she was almost apologetic. She, she you, you heard her say that she said, that she wouldn't be doing her job if she didn't do this. And it was made clear to me that someone had said this, um, that I, I had to make sure that income came through the firm, that I couldn't structure money. In other words, I had the impression that there was concern that maybe 
like Mark Ball and Ronnie Crosby said, that maybe I was hiding, hiding um, fees because of the civil boat case. But well, that conversation was so quick, Mr. Waters, that you keep using the, the, the term confrontation. I didn't take it as a confrontation. And you're telling this jury you're not making that issue fit. Make your story fit with those facts by saying, ah, uh, it wasn't a big deal, and Jeannie, she's hurt, so she's overreacting now. No, that's We've not what I'm saying. got to stand and testify. What I'm saying is exactly what I just testified to, that to me on that day, that was not a confrontation. It ended almost as quickly as it began, and I didn't think about it again for a period of time until after everything happened. You testified earlier, you get paranoid if a police officer turns out behind you, but you're not getting paranoid when Jeannie comes in here and says, I need an answer about these fees? No, because- I believe you took them? No, it, things like that wouldn't cause, the, the, the paranoid thought and the, and the paranoid thinking, it was always related to pills. It was always, okay, that reaction that somebody just gave me. Do, it was do, always related to pills. Do, do they know something? Did something somebody said? It, it was, I mean, the, the, the times, that, that's what, when I, when I had to deal with paranoid thinking, that, you know, if a, if a judge confronted me in the courtroom about a piece of evidence, or if uh, Jeannie asked me about that, those, those are not things that gave me paranoid thinking. Okay. And you testified the same thing about the boat hearing on June 10th. Not worried about it, no big deal, correct? No, I didn't say that it was no big deal, but I said that my main concern about those motions coming up on June the 10th dealt more with the venue motion than they did with the motion to compel, I believe is what I said. Are you saying on this jury that you didn't testify yesterday that you weren't concerned about it? I wasn't overly concerned about it. Okay. And I'm sure I had some level of concern because uh -huh. the venue motion was, it was, a, it was a big issue in the case. Well, were you concerned enough about it to bow up with Mark Tinsley at the trial lawyers conference and say, what are you doing, Bo? No. Absolutely, unequivocally, never happened. Okay. If the Ferris fee issue comes to light on June the 7th, you're not going to be able to borrow money from Johnny Parker anymore, are you? If the Ferris fee, hypothetically speaking, if the Ferris fee came to light on June the 7th, well, here, any point in time, if the Ferris fee came to light, Johnny Parker would not loan me money. Okay. If, if, if Johnny knew that I had taken fees, I would not have been able to borrow money from Johnny Parker. testified earlier about going to the uh, Gamecock baseball game on the weekend prior to Monday, June the 7th, 2021, correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Hold on for me real quick. Sir? I'm going to show you what's been marked as stage 572 to this trial. You got your readers with you, your glasses. And 
have you, first I just want you to look through that document and then answer the question, do you generally know what that is? Someone wants something, so if you'll stand for a moment. Everybody stand for a moment. Come to order. Let me please court. Have you had a chance to review that, Mr. Murdoch? Yes, sir. All right. And do you recognize what those are generally? I do. And what are they? Text between Maggie and I. And what day do they take place? Um. June the, June the 6th. June the 6th, 2021. Is that correct? That's correct, yes, sir. All right, at this time, the state would offer states 572 in evidence. No objection. To admit without objection. All right. Tell the jury, where were you when these texts were taking place? I was in the hotel. And where, what city were you in? Columbia, South Carolina. All right. And where were uh, I'm not exactly sure where they were when they first started, but they would have been somewhere between a hotel, a restaurant, and the ball field. All right. But when you send this text on June 6th at 11:41, you say y'all in seat already, correct? Yes, that's what I did say. And they say, yeah, uh, Maggie says, yes, we like these seats. Is that correct? All right, that's correct. I, I didn't notice that. So at that point in time, they are in the ballpark. All right. All right, and then you respond better than last night. They extended checkout to one. Going to come then. Is that correct? That's what that text says. Yes, sir. All right, so you're back at the room. Is that right? Yes, sir. Later on, you text after she asked you to bring a charger and says, Muggy, you text, I'm dreading it. See you in a little bit. Is that correct? That's what I said. Yes, sir. She responds, don't come, but then asked about the charger and says it's hot. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Waters, I, yes, I assume you were reading it exactly so. Yes, sir. Right. She eventually responds, not crowded, but not the place to come. If you don't feel well, very hot and muggy, we are inside, sitting at the bar very nice indoors. Is that correct? That's what it says. Yes, sir. You respond, doubt you by accident, they are making me leave, so I'll see y'all in a few. Is that correct? That's correct. And who was making you leave where? Uh, it, was che it was past checkout time at the hotel. After you'd gotten an extended checkout, correct? It appears so. And the reality is, 
is that you were in that hotel suffering from withdrawals when that's going on. Is that correct? I was beginning to, yes, sir. All right. And the reality is, is that your wife and your son were on you at that time period because they had found pills just a few weeks prior. No, sir, that's not correct. Let's talk about June 7th, okay? You uh, got up that morning, or what time do you think you got up and left that day? After having the benefit of looking at all these records, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what time I got up. And, and looking at the records, obviously I've been up for a while, um, but it appears I left shortly after noon. Okay. And you went to work? I did, yes, sir. And what were you working on at work? I was working on uh, this Dominion Energy case uh, was primarily what I was working on that uh, we had motions coming up later in that week. Um, as I said earlier, it's, I believed at the time um, that it was the biggest case that I'd ever been involved in. Um, and there were motions coming up in that. Uh, I was Baron Danny had been Danny Henderson, my partner, that was helping me with the civil uh, case from the boat wreck, had been on me about getting a financial statement, and I finished doing that so that it could be given to Danny. It's primary. It's what I remember doing. I obviously, I, I talked to Jeannie. Um, And what time did you leave? And I'm sure I did some other routine office things, but I can't tell you what they are. All right. What time did you leave? Uh, it appears that I left around a little after 6 from the records. Okay. And I thought I'd left earlier than that, but, I mean, the records were seemed to be pretty clear. All right. And you were, in fact, I think you said in both many of your interviews that you were working on the boat case that day as well your financial declaration? Uh, yes, I, I prepared the financial declaration. I didn't do any work in this civil case. Um, so my, my work in, in, in that is what I did. I prepared the financial statement, which took me a little bit of time to, 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 to get the details on that. But I mean, that was the work I did on in preparation for the motions coming up. And what time did you get home? Um, in looking at the records, it looks like I got home uh, a little before 7, 6.45, I think, 6, 6.40 something. Mm -hmm. Then you and Paul rode the property? That's did correct. You, and you, you told law enforcement you shot a twenty two. That's correct. You told law enforcement that you never saw any blackout? That I'd never seen a blackout? That, at that point in time when you and Paul were riding the property? No, I did not see a blackout. Did you tell law enforcement that you and Paul were around, going around looking for hogs? If I and, said that... Go ahead. And, and, if I told them that, you know, you don't look for hogs in the daytime, all right? That just, the hogs are deep in the swamp in the daytime. So I can tell you that Paul and I were not riding around looking for hogs. But what we were doing is we were going from food plot to food plot, and we were looking for hog signs, all right? What a hog will do is come out and root, and they tear up food plots. They tear up, they tear up everything. And so... 
that was one of the things we were doing. But we were not hog hunting. We were not looking for hogs. We did not have the 300 blackout with us. Okay. Paul didn't have the gun that he, that blackout that he favored with him while y'all rode the property. The gun that's in here? Any, any rifle. There was no 300 blackout with me and Paul. All y'all had was a 22. And that was a 22 pistol, but we didn't have that with us at that time riding the property. Right. And you testified, you've seen this, the Snapchat video of you in the tree, is that right? I have seen that. And you don't dispute the time of that video, do you? I don't, I don't even know what time that was taken, but whatever the gentleman we'll came and testified to, I don't dispute that. All right. And what time, well, let me ask you this. When did you go back to the house? Were you with Paul or were you by yourself? I was by myself when I went back to the house. I went back to the house basically when Maggie got there. When Maggie got there. All right. And where, where had Paul gone prior to that? Was he back at the house already or he came after you? Paul was at the shop when I went back to the house. All right, so you beat him to the house is what you're saying, is that right? I beat him to the house? Yeah, you were at the house prior to him getting there. Yes. All right, and you say Maggie was there at the same time or there before you or there after you? That's what I'm not absolutely certain about. Mm -hmm. I believe that Maggie came through the kennel entrance and going back and looking at these records and these times, I believe she came through the kennel entrance while Paul, Paul and I were at the shop. But either way, I got to the house very shortly after Maggie got there. Okay. And I, I believe that she came through. And I believe that I went right behind her. And when did you take the shower that you've been talking about to this jury? I believe when I first went in the house. I mean, I would have talked to Maggie for a second, but I'd seen her that morning, so I would you left your clothes on the floor? I'm not sure. It makes sense to me given what Blanca's um, said, but I, I couldn't tell you one way or the other. All right. About what time was that, you think? In looking at the records, I think that was a little after 8. And you're saying Maggie was already there at that point? When I got to the house? Yeah. Yeah. And what did you do after that? I came back out, sat out on the couch to eat dinner. All right. What about what time was that? A few minutes later. I mean, it didn't take me long to shower. And you say Paul was already eating at that point? He was. And you say he left first. What I what I said is he got up and he finished eating. Mm -hmm. And he left our immediate vicinity. Now, um, I don't believe he left at that point, given what I've looked at time records and all. I believe that he was around the house for a little bit longer. And just to be clear, again, but I didn't see him. All of this detail was people were hearing for the first time yesterday, like we talked about before, correct? Say that again. All of this detail that we're going through right now is not anything that you related before. We're all hearing this for the first time yesterday. Objection, Your Honor. Fifth Amendment privilege. Objection is overruled. So, yes, I, I, I did not tell law enforcement. Actually, I don't think law enforcement asked me what I did when we first went to the house, but I clearly lied to law enforcement about what I, what I said yesterday. Okay. And all of this, the last time you saw your, supposedly saw your wife and child, all of this detail, you, you as a lawyer and a prosecutor didn't think that was important to offer on your own? 
Oh, I think it's important. You told this jury how cooperative you were been, you've been and how much information you wanted to provide, but you left out the most important parts, didn't you? I left out, I left out that, I sure did. You don't consider that one of the most important parts? I think it's important. <clears throat> All right, tell me about what happens next. Tell me about how Maggie and Paul end up out down at the kennels. I'm not, I'm still not absolutely certain exactly how they ended up at the kennel, but in looking at the time frames and looking at the, the GPS points, I, I think I pretty well know because I wasn't sure if Maggie had walked to the kennels mm -hmm. or, or ridden to the kennels. And I wasn't exactly sure how Paul Paul got there, but um, I'm all but certain that Maggie and Paul went to the kennel together. All right. And what was the discussion? You said that they were going down there, but you didn't want to go. Is that right? Maggie. What I said is Maggie asked me to go to the kennels with her, and I wasn't going to go. I said I'm not going to go. And how long after she left did you supposedly go down there? It, it, it was very quickly. And what did you tell this jury and all these new facts as to the reason you changed your mind? Why'd you change your mind? I just had a shower. No more, when, when you go to the kennel, you always end up you're at the shop, the dogs are running around, you're always going to end up doing more work. Mm -hmm. All right? It's hot. I'd already had a shower. I didn't want to go to the kennel. I understand that. So why'd you change your mind? Because Maggie wanted me to. All right. So you thought about it for a few minutes and then decided to go down there? I don't think I sat and contemplated, am I going to go, am I going to go? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, like many things Maggie wanted me to do, if I didn't do it at first, I ended up doing it. And you took the golf cart down to the kennels? That's correct. How long did that take to drive from the house down to the kennels in a golf cart? You know, I, I, in looking at the records from OnStar and all of that, it seems to take about a minute in the... Um, in a golf cart? Nope. In the, in the suburban, mm -hmm. so I would think it's probably, in looking at those speeds, uh, what, 20, 24 miles an hour, I would think it takes double that. I think it takes a couple minutes. All right, so you'll concede at least a couple minutes to drive down there. Is I that think, right? yes. In a golf cart? That's correct. <clears throat> when the kennel video was going on, had you arrived before that? I believe that I had. Okay. How long do you think you had been there before that was going on? Not long. Um, because when I got there, in looking at the kennel video, you can see Paw Paw standing in the kennel. Mm -hmm. When I got there, Paw Paw wasn't standing in the kennel. He wasn't in the kennel anymore? Well, he wasn't in the kennel. like. He is in the video. Right. He's, I mean, he's probably, and I don't know exactly, but I know he wasn't in the kennel. He was like in the driveway. He was fooling with cash. He was in the driveway, um, but like close to the kennel, but not in the kennel like he is in the video. So the video happened after that, according to you? Video happened after I got after there. After you first saw Paul, you're saying he wasn't in the kennel. When did the video happen? I believe that to be the case. Okay. After you had arrived, is that correct? Yes. And very shortly after I arrived, but mm -hmm. after I arrived. All right. And did you tell Maggie at that time that you were going to go to Alameda? I did not. Did y'all discuss it at all, according to you, to these new facts you're testifying to? I don't believe so. Did you have any conversation with her? Oh, yeah. Had you had a conversation, did you have a conversation with Paul about the dogs, about Cash's tail prior to going down there? Prior to going down there? Mm -hmm. I don't, did I have a conversation with Paul yes. about Cash? Did you Cash? talk to him about Cash and some problem with his tail prior to going down there? Did you have any knowledge of that prior to going down there? I'm not sure. As I sit here today, I, I don't recall that, but 
I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. When you first arrived in the golf cart, where did you pull up to? I pulled up right where Maggie was. Which is where? She was standing in a spot where she could see in between the chicken coop and the storage room of the kennels, okay. where the dogs were back up in those planted pines behind the kennels to the left of the chicken coop. And what did you do after that? I went back to the house. No, I mean, did you, you pulled up, you get out of the, the, uh, the golf cart? Oh, when I, no, when I pulled up, I stayed on the golf cart. You stayed on the golf cart. How long did you stay on the golf cart? <laughs> However long I was down there. The entire time? No, I got off to take the chicken from Bubba. All right, so how long were you down there before you took the chicken off of Bubba? Very short time. Like what? Couple minutes. And what were you doing during the couple minutes before you got over there to deal with Bubba? Talking to Max. All right. And what did y'all talk about? I don't know. You don't remember? No, sir. I do know that uh, Maggie was very concerned about Papa, and um, you remember a lot of detail about all these new facts, but you don't remember what you talked about. I don't remember the exact details of what we talked about. I believe that at that time we may have talked about Paw Paw, but I'm not certain. Were you withdrawing at this time? At this time, no, sir. You weren't withdrawing at all? No. I mean, I would only withdraw when I didn't have pills. And you're saying you had pills? Yes. Down there for a couple minutes, I think you've said now, before you get off the golf cart? About, yes, sir. All right. And where do you go at that point? I take the chicken from Bubba. All right. So you get up? Well, I mean, Bubba's, you know, Bubba's come out there with this chicken. I mean, he's showing us, hey, I caught this chicken. Mm -hmm. And... I take the chicken from Bubba. So Bubba came up to the golf cart? He came up by the golf cart. He came up to Maggie and I, which I was on the golf cart. She's by the golf cart. I mean, he's not coming to the golf cart, but he's coming to us. Is this during the kennel video or is this after the kennel video? Well, no, you hear Maggie say he's got a chicken. Okay. That's what she's talking about is Bubba caught a chicken. All right. All right. So is the kennel video still going on before you go get the chicken? I mean, you've heard it, correct? You've heard it in this courtroom. I don't know exactly. Um, I, I don't know exactly, but in close timing to Bubba coming out of those woods with the chicken, mm -hmm. I got up and took the chicken from him. Okay. Let me ask you this. Were the dogs barking and carrying on or going out into the woods or acting like they sensed somebody was around that they didn't know? Were the dogs acting like there was somebody around that they didn't know? Yeah, like dogs do. No. The, no, they the, weren't. There was nobody there was no around dog. that the dogs didn't know. Okay. Dogs didn't, didn't, to your indication, sense anything out of the ordinary. They were just chasing after the guinea. There was nobody else around. All right. Good. For them to, to, to sense. You've heard the kennel video. Would you agree with me that it lasts for about 50 seconds? I, I agree with that. So it would have ended around 8.45 and 45 seconds. Would you agree with that? I do agree with that. Did you have the chicken out of Bubba's mouth at the end of the kennel video, or did it take longer than that? You know, I can't remember exactly when in the video he came up, up with the chicken, but I would, have had to, I would have had the chicken out of his mouth within 10, 15 seconds of, of Maggie saying he's got a chicken. All right. And so then what did you do? I put the chicken up. All right. How long did that take? Did you get out of the golf cart to do that? I did. All right. And you had to go walk to where it was? Well, yeah. I mean, it, a few feet, but I, I, 
I did that, yes. All right, so how long did that take? I seconds. Mean, we're, we're at 846 now. How long did that take? Seconds. Just seconds? All right. And what did you do after that? Got back on the golf cart. Mm -hmm. And what did you do after that? I left. You left? Now, Just did I jumped leave? on the golf cart and left. Well, that's what I was getting ready to say. Did I get on the golf cart and leave that second? Probably not. But did I get on the golf cart and leave very quickly after that? I did. Okay, yeah, I think you testified yesterday. I got out of there. I did. Why'd you get out of there so quick, Mr. Murdoch? Because it was chaotic, it was hot, and I was getting ready to do exactly what I didn't want to do. You were getting ready to do what you didn't want to do. That's correct. Yeah. I was getting ready to sweat. I was getting ready to work. I went back to the air conditioner. So did you say goodbye, according to your new story? Did I say goodbye? Yeah. Did you talk to them at all, or did you just get the chicken, put it on there, jump on there, and just oh, no. take off? I wouldn't have just gone off. I mean, I would have said, I'm leaving. Okay. Did I say goodbye or bye? And again, go but, ahead. I mean, there would have been some... You know, there, there would have been some exchange. I'm not staying here. Well, what was that exchange? I mean, you have, you've had such a photographic memory about these news stories. What, 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 what happened here? No, that's not, I can't tell you the exact words. You don't remember your conversation after you put that chicken up. Did y'all talk about the chicken? No, I don't think we did. Did you talk with Paul about Cash's tail? After the chicken? Yeah. No, I, I know I didn't do that. Did you tell Maggie I'm going to go check on him? At that point, no, I don't. I did don't you think tell I did. Maggie oh, it's hot out here? If they gonna go back? I, I certainly would have said something to that effect. All right. So, unlike everything else with the new story, you just can't recall what what that would have been. Well, I, you know, I mean. You're making that categorization. I, I think there's other things about that that I can't remember. But if the question is, can I remember exactly what words I used when I gave Maggie some uh, salutation when I'm leaving, I can't tell you what those were. All right. But it would have been something to the effect of, I'm leaving. All right. Okay. But well, you would concede that there was at least some conversation, that you wouldn't have just put the chicken on there and jump, ran back to the golf cart and taken off. Correct. Without talking to Maggie, I would have never done that. All right. All right. So, Will, let's, uh, you want to say a minute? Does that sound about right? A minute for what? To have just whatever interaction it took for you to then, according to your new story, drop back to. No, sir. It, it wouldn't have taken me a minute. It would have been, it would have said, it would have been, I'm leaving. I'll see you in a minute. Okay. So, 30 seconds? I don't think it would have taken 30 seconds, but I mean, I'm fine with you using whatever time you want to apply. Well, but I don't I'm think I'm just it would have asking taken about real life here and, and how people interact with one another, uh, Mr. Murdoch. I mean, so what you're telling this jury, I call you're fuzzy on these kind of details, is that you jetted down there, you dealt with the chicken, and jetted right back. No, no sir. No, sir. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't jet down there, and I didn't jet back. I got up after Maggie asked me to leave, after, after Maggie asked me to go with her, and I didn't. I got up, I went and got on a golf cart, mm -hmm. I drove down there, I did what I did, I said I'm leaving or something to those words, mm -hmm. and I went back. All right. Well, if it's about 846, if the kennel video ends at 845 and 45 seconds, and it's about 846, we at least can see that maybe it was about a minute before you got on that golf cart and headed back. Just reasonable real life. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it was that long, but maybe, sure. All right, so. But I don't think it was that long. I mean, right, well, exactly long what I thought was going to be going on at that kennel, why I didn't want to go there to begin with, is exactly yeah. what was going on. Yeah, well, I get that. Again, and I left. Are these also... Convenient facts in your new story that have to fit with the timeline now that that evidence has been thrown in your face? No, sir. Does that sound like real life to you, that you jet down there and jet back, Mr. Murdoch? Mr. Waters, as I just told you, I didn't get on my golf cart and jet down there. I didn't jet back. The reason your, why you have to be so on, fuzzy Mr. about Waters, these details. Mr. Waters, hang on. Just answer before another question is presented. 
Yes, sir. I'm, I'm answering your question. Just a moment. Are you responding to the last question? Yes, sir. I'm responding to your question, and, and, and you're using words that I'm not using. And, and, and I'm, that's your categorization. Do you agree I'm entitled to ask my questions to you, sir? Absolutely. Okay. And, and I'm going to answer them. All, right. All I'm saying is I'm, I'm taking issue with the manner in which you're changing what I'm saying. So and you disagree this is a new story? You disagree with that characterization? Yes, this, this is the first time that this is being told openly. And you disagree to my characterization that you've got a photographic memory about the details that have to fit now that you know the, these facts, but you're fuzzy on the other stuff that complicates that. You disagree with that? I do disagree with that. I, I, I think that I, I, think th right. that I have a good this? memory about a lot of things on this. How about this? We got the Kimmel video ending at 845.45. So just to take care of the chicken, put it up. I was going to say 847, but somewhere around there. I think you said somewhere around there. Is that fair? Just to do whatever you need to do and get on that cart before you head back. The kennel video ended at 845? In 45 seconds. 846. It, it certainly could have been 847 before I left out of there. Okay. I think it was sooner than that, but it could have been. All right. That's 60 seconds. And 50, 75 seconds, correct? After it ends. If it ends at 8.45 and 45 seconds, it's a minute and 15 seconds. And you characterized it yesterday as I got out of there, right? That is exactly what I did. Right. So if we're at 8.47, I think you said, giving you the benefit of the doubt, it's two minutes to get up back to the house, correct? Approximately. All right. And when you got back to the house, where'd you park the golf cart? Same place I'd gotten it from, right where Mark Ball testified that it was. All right. And what door did you go in? I would have gone in the front door. And if you left around 847, and it took about two minutes to get up to the house, what time would that make it, Mr. Murdoch? If I left at 847, and if it took me two minutes, that would make it 849. 849. And you testified you went inside and the TV's on, right? I did go inside and the TV was on. Okay. And you laid down, is that right? I did. All right. Before you said you'd been napping for an hour or so, or napping that entire time, but now you you lay down on the couch? That's correct. All right. And maybe doze for a second? Maybe. According to your new story? How long did you doze? I, I, if, if I dozed, extremely short time. Extremely short time? Because you would agree with me that at 9.02, you're up and moving, according to the data. I agree that according to that data, my phone's recording steps at whatever time it is, 9.02 something. How long did it take you, if you're at the house at 8.49, how long before you went late on the couch? I would have gone straight to the couch, probably. I may have gone by the sink or, I, you know, I may have gotten a spit cup, but it would have been basically straight to the couch. Straight to the couch? Yes, sir. And you're telling this jury that that's what happened and you were back at the house at 849 and you lay down on the couch and dozed for a second and then you were up with more steps in a shorter time period than you had done all day. Well, I mean, your number is 849. What I'm telling this jury is that I went down there and when I took that chicken from Bubba, I would have said something to Mags. I got back on that golf cart and I drove back to my house. After getting back to my house, I went inside, and in short order, I went to the couch. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm telling this jury. Did you go anywhere, anywhere else in the house? Mr. Waters, I can't 
tell you specifically about that. I, I don't think so, but I may have. Did you have that tan blackout and a 12 gauge shotgun on that golf cart when you drove down there? No. You didn't? No. Did you see them when you were down there? No. No. So we got you back around 849 and you're leaving at 902, correct? And you didn't see any weapons down there. You just happened to be back there. You didn't hear anything at all. Did you hear anything at all, Mr. Murdoch, during that time period? No, I did not. You didn't? Didn't you tell law enforcement that you thought you heard them pull up? Didn't you tell law enforcement that? I did think they had okay. pulled up. All right, so that was that you did think that? Yes. All right. So now you're saying there was a car pulling up? No. You didn't testify to that yesterday, did you, in your new version of events that no, I, you I don't construct? Mr. Waters, I don't believe there was a car pulling up. Okay. But that's what you told law enforcement, didn't you? No, I told law enforcement that I thought they had pulled up. Okay. All right. But you're saying you couldn't hear blackout shots, supposedly, but you could hear that, correct? I didn't say I couldn't hear blackout shots, but I'm saying that I thought when, when I got up from taking a nap, if I took a nap, but when I got up from laying down, as I was getting ready to go to my mom's, there was a point in time where I thought Maggie and Paul had come back. You also told them that you thought you heard a wildcat, but maybe it was a person or something like that as well? No, that's not what I said. What did you say then? I said when I went outside that there's a, a, a house cat that's a, what just gone wild, and he hangs around. He goes from hanging around the shop, goes from hanging around the house, different times. You might, and, and there'll be times you don't see him. And he had been around the house. And when I went outside, I believe that cat was over there. Okay. But and you made a point of mentioning I that never, to law enforcement. I never thought it was a person. All right. But you made a point of mentioning that to law enforcement, correct? In the course of discussing it, I did tell them that. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial. Is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And at the same time, you also looked at this jury and tried to tell them that you had been cooperative in this investigation. Uh, other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. Very cooperative, except for maybe the most important fact of all, that you were at the murder scene with the victims just minutes before they died. Right? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. We'll take a break at this time for about 15 minutes, talking to the jury. Please uh, go to the jury room. Please not discuss the case. Please do not discuss your testimony with anyone during the break. We'll be in recess for 15 minutes.
I remind everyone in the courtroom that there is to be no reaction to the testimony. No jeers, cheers, no reaction at all by anyone in the courtroom. You bring the jury. On the record before the jury comes in. There will be an opportunity to put some something on the record. If it's regarding an objection, it can be done later. Yes, sir. Thank you. You may proceed. When you picked up that chicken, was there any blood on it? I don't believe so. Did you wash your hands or all? Did At that you... point in time, um, I don't believe that I did. And when you say you were there, you said Maggie was near nearby you, is that correct? Right by me. Was she messing with the hose at all? At that time, no, she was not. Did she mess with it the entire time that you were there, according to uh, your new facts today? While I was there, she did not touch. She, she was not fooling with a hose at all. Screen states 519, which is the uh, condensed timeline. If I could have computer input, please. Dense timeline, Mr. Griffin. Thank you. <coughs> coming out all right. Can you see that up there, uh, Mr. Murdoch? <coughs> yes. All right, I'm on page five. You see that uh, cell tower map there? <coughs> That's up on my screen. Yeah. I do see that. Um, would you agree with me that it reflects no cell tower activity on your phone from 6.52 to 9.04? I do agree with that. Let me ask you this, Mr. Murdoch. Did you take your phone with you down to the kennels according to the new facts that you're testified to yesterday and today? I must not have. You must not have? If this is accurate, no, sir. Is that typical for you? Sure it is, it's absolutely. Typical. Okay, tell me why that's typical. If and when I'm going, now, it, wouldn't be, it, it would be unusual if I was going out for any extended period of time, or if I was going uh, 
e even on a property, if I was going somewhere for an extended period of time, I would usually have my phone. But for me to go knowing that I'm going to the kennel and coming right back, that's not unusual at all. I mean, there's very, you've heard the testimony about the service out there. The service is terrible. You have to be in a particular spot. And you have to find a spot. So the answer is you don't know whether or not you took it down there. I believe that I probably didn't based on this data. Based on this, but unlike your photographic memory about other things, you don't remember whether or not you had your phone on you. Mr. Waters, I, I've never claimed to have a photographic memory, but I do not specifically remember if I had my phone that night. I do not dispute it based on these, on this data, and that's not unusual for me. Just like you don't remember, according to your new story, the last conversation you had with Maggie. No, I remember, I remember having the con my last conversation with Maggie. Looking at this screen, you have uh, the map up there. We're on page six, and it shows you arriving back at Moselle at 642. You don't dispute that now, is that correct? No, that's, that's what the, this data appears to show. Okay. And looking at the data, moving on to page seven, you have Paul arriving about 704. Is that correct? You don't have any reason to dispute that? Well, that's what it says. He arrives at 4147 Moselle Road, um, which is the address of the shop. Um, the house is 4157. I believe that Paul actually got there a little bit before that, um, but I think that's approximately accurate. Okay. I think Paul got there a little bit closer to 7 o'clock. Right. You would agree, though, that's the earliest data point that reflects his presence in Moselle? If that's what the records show. You don't dispute that? I don't dispute that that's the, if that's the earliest data point. Um, but again, I believe he got there a little bit earlier. And I, I tried to look at these records to see if I could dis if, if that could be refuted. and. I, I, I believe he got there a little closer to seven or a little bit before seven. Yeah, that's a good point. You looked at these records a lot before you had your testimony yesterday and today, didn't you, Mr. Murdoch? I've looked at these records other than the OnStar records that just came um, when they were provided to me. Sure, I've looked at them. Okay. Uh, right here, we have some steps on your phone, 29 steps, and then down at the bottom, we have uh, 89 steps. Is that uh, consistent when you and Paul were together on the property? I mean, sure, we, we would go to different locations on the property. Sometimes we would get out, sometimes we wouldn't. We'd get out and walk around, we'd look at stuff, we'd do things. For example, you saw me messing with the tree. There'd be other ones, we may get out and look at a feeder. There may be other ones, we get out and look at hog signs, where hogs are rooting. So. It, it, it would be perfectly consistent with what Papa and I were doing that day. And 8.05 to 8.09, <clears throat> would you agree that that's the last steps recorded on your phone before 9.02 when you become a very busy bee? If that's what these records show, I, I see I took steps. These records show I took steps between 8.05 and 8.09. All right. So would you concede then that you're at the house around 8.09? I would have thought so, yes. Okay. And you said Paul was already back at that point? No. I, I, I said just the opposite. When did he get there? All right. Are you talking about when I left the shop and went to the house when Maggie was there? Yes, before you ate dinner. No, as I said earlier, Paul and I were at the shop. Mm -hmm. Maggie got home. I left Paul at the shop, and I went to the house. Mm -hmm. I think you were saying that I said I met Paul at the house, and that's incorrect. Paul was still down at the shop when you were at the house, correct? When I first went to the house, Paul was still at the shop, I believe. All right, and was Maggie there when you arrived at the house? 
Yes, I believe she was. All right. And 809 is the last steps that you have on this phone before 902, correct? That's what the data shows. Looking now at page 15. I'm sorry, page 14. Your steps that you say when you got to the house is 809 and Paul was still down at the shop. But don't these records reflect that Paul is pinging with GPS data at the house at 808? This record appears to show Paul at the house at 808. All right. So those records don't fit with your new story that you've testified yesterday and today. Is that correct? No, I, I don't. I don't believe even right now, Mr. Waters, that that's right. I'm not saying what you're doing is you're taking 809 and saying that I'm at the house. And I mean that may or may not be right. But what I'm saying is is that when Maggie came through, I left and I believe that Paul um, stayed at the shop. Now, did Paul come right behind me? I I'm not sure, but when I, when I left him, I believe that, when I left to go to the house, I believe that Paul stayed at the shop for a minute. When you got to the house, did you put your phone down? I'm sure I did. Did you put it in the car, in the Suburban? Did I put it in the Suburban? When you got back to the house, did you put it in the Suburban? Was the Suburban parked out front? Uh, the Suburban would have par been parked wherever I parked it. Which is where? I believe on the side. Okay. And did you put the phone, your phone in the Suburban? At that time? Mm -hmm. No, I did not. Where'd you put it? I'm not sure where I put it. You're not sure about that either, huh? No, I'm not sure. When I went in the house, I'm not sure where I put my phone. I would think that I, you know, I would think that I put it uh, down somewhere, probably by the couch. Didn't you testify yesterday when you were being asked by your, your lawyer about that pause at Alameda when you were living, leaving and you had a very specific recollection of your phone had fallen down in the crevice and you had to pick it up and get it out? You remember testifying to that? I do. But you don't remember what you did with your phone when you got back at this point, huh? I mean, Mr. Ward, those are two distinct different things. I'm, I'm coming in the house and I put my phone down. I don't have a routine spot that I put it in right on this corner or right there, you know. Yeah. I, I, would, I would assume that when I went in the house, I put it somewhere either on the table you go by, going to the, going to the couch. I may have taken it to the bathroom um, that, when I took a shower. It, it may have it? taken me a, a, a few minutes to go to the shower. Uh, so that I can't tell you exactly story. where I put it. That console story is an awful specific recommend, uh, recollection when you need it to try to make the new story that this jury's hearing and everyone's hearing yesterday and today with the data, correct? But you're awful fuzzy on far more important things, aren't you, Mr. Murdoch? Which, which question? I, here, I'll answer the first one first. No, I, first one first I, I, I don't believe that's convenient and I disagree with your um, categorization uh, of the description. All right. But you, you remember the console story, but you don't remember where you put your phone, whether or not you took it down to the kennels, whether it was in the, uh, you put it in the Suburban, don't remember any of that, but Dad Gilman, you remember that uh, console story, correct? Well, I don't remember the console story, but you know, in that Suburban, and, and it's not the first time that it happened, but when that phone got down there, you had to go to great efforts to get it out, and you couldn't just reach over there and get it out. All right, you say when you got to the house that Maggie was already there? Yes. Okay. And we saw your last steps were at 809? Well, that's what you saw when my, this data recorded my last steps, but as you heard this testimony too, um, Mr. Waters, you know, that's not a precise, that, that's not a, a, a precise, you heard the testimony, you know what it is. Well, how did you get back to the house? Remind us. From the shop? Yeah. I went in the white pickup truck. Went in the white pickup truck? Okay. And when you got in the house, where did you go? 
we, we've already discussed this. I, I, I took a shower. Whether I did things for a moment before I went to the shower, I'm sure I talked to Maggie um, because she'd been gone. And if she came through the kennel, which I believe she did, we only talked briefly. So I would have talked to her, uh, but I would have quickly gone to take a shower. Going over to page 16, you would agree with me that the data reflects Maggie start logging steps and her phone disconnecting from the Mercedes around 817, correct? I agree. At 817, her phone ends connection to her Mercedes. And starts logging steps? I don't see that, but I don't dispute it. You see the purple line talking about it disconnecting from the Mercedes. I and do see. I see, the, I see where you're talking about. So yeah, yeah. I see at 817, her phone starts logging steps. I agree with that. Okay. So would you concede that that appears to be when she arrived? Uh, no, I, I don't believe that's when she arrived. I, I, I believe that, I mean, it, it was very normal for Maggie um, when she's driving to jump out of the car, run inside, go to the bathroom, do things and either send me or Paul or go back or Buster or go back to her car herself and unplug her phone. So, I mean, I agree that's when her phone's unplugged, but I believe that Maggie got to the house a little bit before that. That's the whole reason why Paul and I went to the house. Okay. But you're saying Paul arrived after Maggie, is that what you're saying? At the house? At I believe so, time? yes, sir. Okay. That's what I recall. And, and Paul arrived at the house after I arrived at the house, I believe. <clears throat> and if Paul got to the house around about that same time, he wasn't inside with Maggie and I when I went to get to the shower. So you say if Paul got, he wasn't inside with Maggie and you? Is that what you said? Mr. Murdoch, is that what you said? Sir? You said if Paul got the house prior to that, he wasn't inside with you and Maggie, is that what you said? I'm saying he was not inside when I went to get in the shower. Okay. But again, looking back at this data point, 808, we see a little blue dot right there in the middle of the house, don't we? Yeah, that's what these records show. Okay. And it also shows that circle that folks testified to what the range of what it could yeah, absolutely. be within. So, I mean, it clearly could look be. Look at that circle. Look. Look at what's right in the middle of that circle. Almost like somebody drew a circle around the house, don't you agree? Yeah, I do, but also in that circle is where you would park a truck if you pulled up. All right. So, you know, and I'm not saying that he wasn't in the house uh, at some point in time there, but when I went to get in the shower, he wasn't in the house. And he very easily could have been there and been parked in the yard. All right. You agree at the bottom of page 16 that uh, about 8.30, Maggie starts tracking steps again on her phone? Yes, sir. That's what the data shows. with me that about 838 Paul's phone shows him back up at the kennels well uh, yes sir I agree that at 838 let me see which one it's hard for me to figure out which one of these rings but at 838 it shows Paul in whichever one of those rings is 56 meters 
واحد And I have no reason to believe he wasn't at the kennel. Right. And then 844.55, we've already gone through this, but that's the kennel video, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And you would agree with me that it lasts about 50 seconds, correct? Uh, yes, sir, I agree with that. And you would agree with me moving on to page 19 that both Maggie and Paul's phones Locked for the final time around 8.49. That's what the data shows. After that, you agree that Maggie's phone around 8.53 shows some steps being taken? That's what the data shows, yes, sir. Data doesn't show who's carrying it, but that's what it shows. Is that correct? That is correct. And then you would agree with me that from 902 to 906, your phone finally comes to life and starts showing a lot of steps. I do agree with that. What were you doing? I was getting ready to go to my mom's house. Getting ready to go? I thought you took a shower already. You were just laying down on the couch. What, what all you need to do to get ready to go to your mom's house? Uh, I mean, there wasn't anything to get ready in, in that aspect, wasn't but anything to get ready, I was wasn't. getting ready to go. I was preparing to leave. Do doing what? I don't know if I got up, uh, went to the bathroom. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly what I was doing. And that's far more steps in a shorter time period than, than any time prior, as you've seen from the testimony in this case. So what, what were you so busy doing? That's going to the bathroom? No, I don't, I don't think that I Did you get on a treadmill? went to the bathroom. No, I didn't get on a treadmill. Jogging place? No, nope, I didn't jog in place. Jacks? No, sir, I did not do jumping jacks. What were you doing, Mr. Murdoch, for those four months? Preparing to leave for my mom's house. What? What does that mean? I mean, you're in the front room on that couch where you say you laid down. The Suburban's just right outside. What all are you doing? I don't know if I got up and went to my room, went to the gun room, doing went what? back in that. Doing what? You've been so clear in your new story about everything. What, what were you doing during these four minutes? I, I disagree with your assertion about every detail. I don't recall. I know that I was getting up and I was leaving. I was going to check on my mom. But specifically what I was doing, I don't, I, I don't know. Okay. I know what I wasn't doing, Mr. Waters, and what I wasn't doing is doing anything uh, as I believe you've implied that I was cleaning off or washing off or washing off guns or putting guns in a raincoat, and I can promise you that I wasn't doing any of that. Okay. Also during this four minutes where you've got 283 steps, <coughs> not only are you moving around a lot, but you're making a ton of phone calls. Because that, in that same time period, you see this red line right here, where over that four minute period, all those steps were taken. That's also when you're calling, making all these phone calls, isn't it, Mr. Murdoch? Well, I made the so phone calls. So were you calls. in place and making phone calls? Is that what you're doing? He allowed to answer before Mr. Waters steps on him again with another question. Please. Thank you. All right. You were making all these phone calls while you were taking all these steps. Would you concede that where you don't remember what you were doing? Well, I was making phone calls and that's that shown here. At 9.05, I called my dad. You know, I, I don't know that I was taking steps like you're saying I'm taking steps. I heard the same testimony you heard, Mr. Waters, and, you know, steps can be recorded uh, any number of ways. I, I don't have a specific recollection of walking around. I don't know if I was hitting my phone like the guy showed or doing whatever that makes steps, but, you so know. So you were hitting what, your phone like that while you were making all these phone calls? Hang on, no, sir. What I'm saying, Mr. Waters, I don't know that. I'm, I'm just giving you an example. You're saying that I'm running around taking these steps, and while I'm doing that, I'm making telephone calls. What I will agree with is that this data shows that there was 283 steps recorded on my phone. Mm -hmm. And sometime during that period, I made certain phone calls. Okay. All right, so not only for whatever it is, it's recording steps, 
but you're also making a ton of phone calls, including missed calls to Maggie, who is 1,100 feet away, supposedly. You're using the term a ton of phone calls. Yeah. What I agree is that I, I made the phone calls that are listed on these call data records, mm -hmm. which, you know, are very normal phone calls for me. Mm -hmm. Do you know why so many phone calls were missing from the log around this relevant time period when law enforcement downloaded your phone on June 10th? From my phone? Yeah. No, I don't. Did you delete them, Mr. Murdoch? Not intentionally. Just around the time of June 7th, all these calls were missing, but you had nothing to do with that between June 7th and June 10th. No, sir, I did not. Mm -hmm. And I did not delete phone calls from my phone. Mr. Waters, one of the most important things in this whole thing for me has been getting this data that I believe would exist, phone calls and phone records um, would be part of that. I've been in enough civil cases and used phone records enough times to know that you delete a phone call from your phone, it doesn't disappear. So I can tell you, this jury, and everybody who's listening that I did not intentionally delete phone calls from my phone. Yeah, because you started talking about the, your, your former prosecutor, correct, and former lawyer doing civil cases. We went through that yesterday. And boy, you're busy bee on that phone and right out of the gate at 902, right? Get the comments. Objections overruled. Am I a busy bee? Yeah. I, I am using my telephone at I think I call at 905, I start and call my dad, and I agree that I made other phone calls. And one of the first things you start talking about with law enforcement is these calls that you made to Maggie. Correct? You remember, recall that from your first statement to law enforcement? One of the first things that I said to law enforcement? Yeah, that's one of the things you talk about. I'm talking about with your interview with Special Agent Dave Owen. I don't remember that being the first thing we talked about, but first things. if Mr. Owens asked me about it, then I... No, you sure. brought it up, didn't you? I did. You don't recall? No, I don't, I don't recall. Would you dispute me if I said you brought it up? Did I brought up what? Brought your up phone, what? Mr. Murdoch, your phone. Phone calls to Maggie? Yes. Did I brought up phone calls to Maggie to David Owens? I'm asking you, is that one of the things that you talked about in your first interview with Dave Owen? That you pulled out your phone and started looking at it, that you brought that up? Do you recall that? Well, but that's not what you asked, Mr. Owens. You, you asked me, was that the first thing that I talked to him about? And that was the discrepancy. I certainly don't dispute that Mr. Owens and I talked about phone calls. But that's not what you said, so just right. to be clear. Well, the real reason, Mr. Murdoch, is that you as a lawyer and prosecutor are up at 9.02, finally having your phone in your hand, moving around and making all these phone calls to manufacture an alibi. Is that not true? That's absolutely incorrect. So that's just another circumstance and coincidence in this particular case right around the time that you lied to law enforcement about maybe one of the most important facts in the case. Comment before the question. It is an absolute fact that I am not manufacturing an alibi, as you say. How do you remember so much detail about everything else, but you don't remember what you were specifically doing to generate 283 steps while you're making these, all these phone calls in the same four minute period? I remember unequivocally, without any doubt, with as clear a mind as I could have mm -hmm. at any time, that I never manufactured any alibi in any way, shape, or form because I did not and would not hurt my wife and my child. So, why so can't I you know for a fact that I never, ever, ever created an alibi. Why don't you remember what you were doing when you were so busy for this four minute critical period? I do other remember what I was, I was doing. Other than I was getting ready to go. Well, that's because that's what I was doing.
Okay. Well, let's keep going. You made those calls to Maggie in that four minute period. You had just seen them a few minutes ago when you say you went down there and came right back. Why didn't you just take that quick little left 1,100 yards away and stop by? See why they didn't answer the call. You're obviously wanting to get in touch with them. Why didn't you go down to the kennels that were so close by? There was no reason to. I mean, Ma You're making multiple missed calls to Maggie, and she's so close. And there's a driveway right there. Why do you not just go down there and say, hey, guys, I'm heading over there? It, it wasn't important to do that. Me, me making those phone calls is simply me letting, I believe I called Maggie and I believe call, I called Paul. But that, that, that's simply me just letting them know that I'm leaving for a minute, I'll be back. The fact that, that they don't answer is not unusual at all. Now, it is odd, it is unusual that they never call me back. Um, and, but, but at that moment, the fact that there's a missed call, when, when I know they're on the property, I mean, that doesn't even register a, at all. I, I, that, that's perfectly normal to try to call somebody who's on the property and not be able to get them. And, and as far as not going down there, uh, there, there was no sense of urgency. Maggie was with Paul. You know, she should be as safe as she could be. And yeah, she should. Um. <clears throat> Did you talk with Maggie about going to Almeida when you were at the kennels? No, I don't believe I did. Did you talk with Maggie about going to Almeida during supper? I know that we had talked about it. I, I had talked. I don't believe we talked about it at supper, but we may have. I know that I had talked about uh, that I was going to go over there. And then uh, I decided that I wasn't going to go over there. Uh, but so I, what I, was your conversation at supper? Tell me specifically, if you could, please. I about can't, going to Almeida. I can't tell you that we specifically talked about. The only thing that I can tell you we specifically talked about at supper was Paw Paw. All right. And what was the conversation? Maggie was just concerned. Paw Paul had been having, for a young person, Paul had been having high blood pressure. Um, and he's very resistant to go to the doctor. And um, this has been going on for a little while, but lately Paul's feet had swollen. And for a 22-year-old to have start to having swollen feet concerned both of us, and it particularly concerned Maggie. And we talked about that. Okay. Did y'all talk about Mr. Randolph at all? I'm sure we did. Do you remember that group text coming in about uh, – whether or not anybody was going to go see Mr. Randolph at the hospital the next day? Do I remember it coming in? Yeah. I don't remember it coming yeah, in. Because you didn't read it until the next day. But I've seen, I've seen the data. Why didn't you, uh, did you ever text the group and say you were going to Almeida at all? No. Did Maggie ever, did you and Maggie ever specifically discuss her going along with you to Almeida? I don't believe that we did. I know that uh, there was a point in time where I said Maggie might go, but it's highly unusual for Maggie to go and visit just my mom. It, it, that, that whole situation, um, it just made, it made Maggie sad, and she didn't like to go. So you, um, I, I don't believe that we did, but I do acknowledge that at some point I said she might go for some reason. You told law enforcement on multiple occasions that, first of all, Maggie was planning to stay at Edisto the night of June 7th, correct? I did say that. All right. And you also said 
that you came to find out that she came home of her own accord. Correct. You told that to law enforcement. Is that true? She did come home of her own accord. That she decided on her own to come home because she was worried about you. Isn't that what you said? I did say that, and I, right. I, I believe that to be the case. All right. But since we've, despite what you told law enforcement, we've since seen the text that you actually called her and asked her to come home on the night of June 7th. No, sir, that's not correct. That's not correct? No, sir, that's absolutely not correct. All right, so you heard your sister-in-law, Marion, testify to just that fact of a conversation she had with Maggie, but you're saying that's not true? I don't believe that's what Marion said. All right, and you, your defense put in this exhibit, Exhibit 107, where Maggie texted Blanca and said, Alec wants me to come home. I've, s I've seen that, I agree with that. Is that it up on the screen? Oh, I've got the wrong input here. I'll just hold it up. You've seen this text? I have seen that. M Mr. Waters, the only dispute I have with what you're saying is you're, you're saying that I called Maggie and wanted her to come home. I always wanted Maggie to come home. And I would have talked to Maggie about coming home before she ever left to go uh, to Charleston and to Edisto. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this, and I didn't realize this at the time, but I realize it now, that Maggie was already undecided. About, now, I didn't know this, but Maggie was already undecided about uh, staying at Edisto. I can promise you that because Bubba and Grady were in their kennels, as y'all well know, that night. If uh, that day, if Maggie was certain that she was spending the night at Edisto, at a minimum, Bubba would have been with her and probably both dogs would have been with her. It was very unusual for her to spend the night anywhere without one of us or those dogs. So, so you're that saying tells me that when she left that morning, she was already seriously thinking about coming back. So you're saying that you never called her and had a conversation that day asking her to come home specifically on the night of June 7th, 2021. Maggie and I had a couple of phone conversations that day. What I'm telling you is Maybe that before question, she please. left, no, no. I, I don't believe we had a phone call about that. We may have discussed it during the phone call, but I didn't make a phone call to her to ask her to come home. I had already told her I wanted her to come home. I always wanted her to come home. You heard Marion say that too, mm -hmm. that I always wanted Maggie with me. Maggie thought enough of it to talk about it with Marion, didn't she? The fact that I wanted her to come home? Correct. Well, sure. I mean, that's what Marion said. So you're denying that you called Maggie and specifically asked her to come home that night? I didn't make a phone call to Maggie to ask her to come home that night. I asked Maggie to come home long before she ever left. And I probably asked her again each time I talked to her, but I didn't make the phone call specifically for that, as you're saying. And to be clear, I'm certain that if Maggie was certain that she was spending the night, Bubba would have been with her and probably Grady. All right. Why did you tell law enforcement, though, that you found out after the fact that Maggie wanted to come home because she was concerned about you? Why would you phrase it that way if what you're saying to the jury now was accurate? Why would you phrase it that way? Because I believe that to be the case. That you found out afterwards, but now you're saying you knew. No, I'm saying I found out afterwards why she came home, Mr. Waters. And she came home because she was worried about me. So I want to be clear about that. I did not learn that until, I think, the day after she got killed. But you're saying that you found out that after the fact, but you're telling this jury that you knew the things that you just said about her wanting to come home. And you were unaware of what Marion would say at that point either. No, I'm saying at that time, I had not thought about Bubba and Grady. 
since that time, I've thought about that. I'm certain of that. At the time, I thought Maggie was staying at Edisto. All right? She was going to Edisto to, do the, to meet the people, to do the work. Maggie loved to stay at Edisto. There's no doubt about that. It would not be unusual at all for her to stay at Edisto. But just like every other time, I had already asked her, please come back, come back. Always wanted her to stay with me. Always. But I did not learn about, and, and Maggie even texted me, I'll see you in a few hours. But I did not know why she decided to come back until later, is what I'm saying. And I learned it from Blanca. Blanca actually showed me the text that she sent her talking about being worried about me. You would agree with me that you sent a text to Maggie at 908.58 while in motion in the Suburban, as reflected by the data? I do. which was because I couldn't reach them by the telephone and I wanted them to know where I was. Okay. Which is what we do. And you got to Alameda around 922? I believe that's correct. I can go down to it. No, I, I, don't, I don't have any reason to dispute that. Made some more phone calls along the way? I did make more phone calls along the way while I was riding. Yeah, call Chris Wilson? I did call Chris Wilson. Had a short conversation with him. Is that right? I did have a conversation for however long the record show. About a one, 131 seconds, so that sound about right? If that's what the record show, two minutes. Called your brother, John Marvin, for about 106 seconds, including connection time, so that sound about right? That does sound about right. Arrived at 922, does that sound about right? It does. And then at 924, you call, that's the landline at Alameda, is that correct? That is correct. And then you went inside, is that right? Yeah, that's Talk right. To Ms. Shelley. That's right. I called the house phone to get Shelly to let me in. And when you were asked by law enforcement how long you were at your mother's house, you said 45 minutes to an hour. Isn't that correct? I think I said a couple of different things, but I think at one time I did say that. But, you know, at, at routinely through these things, I kept saying, you know, when you get this data, you'll see exactly. When you look at my phone, you'll see exactly when you do, you know, so, you know, the, me giving the times was always given with the thought that, okay, that there's OnStar out there, there's whatever. But when you had a conversation with Ms. Shelley after the fact, you actually asked her to say that you were there longer than 20 minutes. You know, I heard Shelley's testimony. I, I believe Shelley to be a good person. Uh, 
I wasn't trying to influence Shelley on any particular length of time because at, at the beginning of this, I believed that data would show what data would show. And for me to tell her to say something when my own star is going to show something different just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I, I can't answer that. What my recollection is is that I told Shelly that, that law enforcement would be talking to her. We may have discussed how long I was there. At that point in time, if I thought I was there 45 minutes, I may have said I was here 45 minutes, but, you know, I can't tell you. That's the same thing that Blanca testified to, that you talked to her about the clothes that you were wearing that made her uncomfortable, correct? Ask that question again. It's similar to your conversation with Blanca that she testified about when you talked to her about the clothes that you were supposedly wearing what, and made her feel uncomfortable. Do you remember that testimony, sir? What's similar to that? Well, that you're talking to both of these individuals about their testimony in a manner that's inconsistent with what they know. No, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't, I don't. I don't think your assertion is accurate. You have to understand this. On August the 11th, when I went to meet with David Owens, and in that, David Owens asked me about. He showed me that Snapchat and asked me about clothes that I had on, and. Um, shortly after that, the next time I was with Blanca, I asked Blanca about those clothes because David Owens had asked me about them and was make, made an issue about it. And so I checked with Blanca to see what, what I specifically uh, asked Blanca. and. It was an issue to me. So I got Blanc and I said, I need you to sit down and talk with me about this. This is important. Do you remember um, my clothes when you came to Moselle that day? And she remembered exactly what she testified to. She remembered that my pants were there. She wasn't sure if the shirt was there. At that time, I think she actually thought the shirt was there, but she was clear that she wasn't sure about that. Um, but, or, or no, no, she wasn't unsure, but she didn't remember, um, but assumed that it was. So that was the conversation that, and why I was asking Blanca. Boy, again, you're very specific about your memories of that conversation. Is that correct, Mr. Murdoch? You're dang right I'm, I, I'm, I'm consistent about that because a very short time before that, David Owens is asking me questions and telling me I'm a suspect in the murder of my wife and my child and asking me about my clothes, you're dang right it was important. It was important, right. And you're dang right I remember what, why I went to her and for what reason. Because the only thing you're concerned about is yourself. You're not concerned about giving accurate information to law enforcement, correct? What's the reason for that, Mr. Murdoch? Why don't you want to give accurate information to law enforcement? Why do you want to talk to these women who both are employed by you or your family and try to influence what they are going to say? Uh, I, I did want to give law enforcement accurate information. I told a lie about being down there, and I got myself wed to that. But I wanted to give them as much. I knew that I hadn't done this, and I wanted to give them as much accurate information as I could. But the reason I went to Blanca is specifically because David Owens talking to me on August the 11th. Okay. You can see that you're underway about 942, heading back. I 942 do. to 943. I do.
Turn on Moselle about 1001. Turn into Moselle at 1001. Yeah. Um, Sorry. It looks to me like I turned into Moselle at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock on the dot. Sorry. Yes, sir. At the house at 10.05. Yes, sir. And then that's when you went back to the kennels after you came back from Almeida, correct? I went to the kennels after I went to the house. At, um, I went from Almeida to the house, to the kennels. And we got to the scene you got out of the car, according to what you told law enforcement, repeatedly, and went and checked the bodies, correct? Before you called 911, is that correct? No, sir, that's not correct. You don't, you're saying you didn't say that to law enforcement? I don't know what I said to law enforcement, Mr. Waters, but I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. When I pulled up, and I saw Max and Paul Paul. I jumped out of that car. I know that I went back to my car and I called 911 as quickly as I could. That point in time, when I got on the phone, then is when I went to them and did the things that I did. You what you're saying is not accurate. You're saying that you didn't say very specifically to law enforcement that you went to them prior to calling 911. When? After you got out of the car, you told law enforcement repeatedly that you went over and checked the bodies before you called 911. No, I don't. If I did say that, I, I don't believe that's accurate. Did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. No, sir. That's not, that's not, I don't, that's not accurate. At least that's not what I remember. That's not what you remember saying, or that's not what you say now happened? No, that's not what, that's not what I believe happened. Okay, but you don't deny that's what you said. Did I said, did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. I don't believe that's what I said. <coughs> now, I know I checked them, but I don't believe I checked them before I called 911. Because I, I can pretty well remember vividly when I checked Paul Paul, I was already on the phone with 911. Looking at this data. show the vehicle parking at 10.05 and 55 seconds. Yes, sir. 10.05.57, the Suburban arrives at the kennels. You agree with that? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, Mr. Warden. At 10.05.57, it shows the Suburban arriving at the kennels. Okay. Okay. The 911 call was at 10.06.14. Okay. Just about 20 seconds later. You agree with that? Um, I think that sounds right. Yes, sir. I mean, that makes sense. The 
that goes back to what I'm saying is I, I pulled up and I saw I saw them and I know I jumped out of my car um, but I believe that before I checked them in fact I'm almost certain that then I went back and I got my that's when I went and got my phone and I called 911 okay. and then after I called 911 they, they I mean there was a little while where there wasn't I don't, I don't think there was anything going on and I believe that that is the time period that I went and checked on them. I don't want to belabor this point, but that what you're saying here today, now that we have this data, that's not exactly how you expressed it to law enforcement in your prior statements. Is that correct? No, sir. I disagree with that. Okay. I totally disagree with that, Mr. Waters. Will you point to what you're talking about? Um, I'll do my, I'll, I'll do the house where I'm watching. All right, Mr. Murdoch, um, state your full name for me, please. Richard Alexander Murdoch. Uh -uh. M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. Alright. And you go by Alec? Yes, sir. And date of birth, Mr. Murdoch? May 27, 1968. And a good phone number for you. 803-942-1223. And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Henderson. Okay. All right. Um, as I stated, I'm David Owen, and I'm Laura Rutland with Collin County. I'm a sled. I hate to have to do this. I understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't you don't have any problem yeah. with it. So, um, just start at the top, take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see them and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. And my, my boy over there, I could see it was... I 
can't see his brain holes. <laughs> turn Paul over first. Um, uh, you know, I tried to turn him over and uh, I don't know, I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife and I uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I called 911 um, pretty much right away. And she was very good. Um, <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and um, what family members did you call? Him? I called my brother Randy. And I called my brother John. And I tried to call a little boy, a real good friend that's right around the corner from here, but I didn't get him. Okay. <clears throat> that person you didn't name, that was Rogan, the little boy right around the corner. Is that who you're talking about? That's correct. But going back to your question, I mean, that's, that's the way I remember it, what I said right there. And I, you know, your, your question about did I do these things before I called 911, that's not what I said then, and that's not what I remember now. Okay. So you're saying now that you went out, you checked, you came back, got your phone, and that's when you called 911? I'm not saying that now, Mr. Wars. I am saying that now, but... To me, that's what I said then. I mean, I, I told her, I called 911 right away. I didn't have, there was no time to do the things that I'm talking about doing in the, in, in the time between getting there and calling 911. When you talked about calling Rogan and you said that he lived right around the corner, correct? That's correct. All right. But Rogan wasn't staying there at the time. That's the whole reason that Cash was at your kennel, right? You knew that. Well, Rogan was staying in, in Buford a lot, but he was home a lot too. I didn't I didn't know where Rogan was on a daily basis. Well, yeah, I to you about keeping his dog Cash at the kennels when he was staying with his girlfriend and working down in Buford? Yes, he he had asked me that. But I mean that had been some time before. I didn't know you're making a big deal about this, Mr. Waters, but that particular night, I, di I didn't have a clue where Rogan was staying or not staying. I was trying to find somebody to come out there with me. I would called Randy, I would called John, and Rogan was the next best alternative. Okay. And Rogan Whoa. is so close. I mean, Rogan, of, of, of all these kids that you've heard, Rogan, Gibson, I mean, Roro is like a, a Rogan, you prefer when I call him Rogan, is truly like a son to Maggie and I. And he was such a good friend to Buster, and he was such a good friend to Paul. And you've been through everything I have. You'll see that two weeks or three weeks prior to this, I ran out of gas when Bus and Paul Paul weren't home. And Rogan's the person that I called to bring me gas. Nobody's disputing in any that Rogan would have helped you. Let me keep playing this. Around, um, Paul, when you walked up. Blood. Any, any other, anything else? 
I mean, there was some body thing. Yes, sir. I mean, like any other evidence, I know you said the phone fell out of the pocket, but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? No, sir. Not, no, not. No, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to, my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover and she fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. You just testified that in the wake of this, you didn't know what you said to law enforcement. That was what you just said. No, I mean, I know, I know a lot of what I said to law enforcement, but there's a lot of things in looking back at this video for one, the 911 call for one. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that I didn't remember. Okay. But right then and there, just not long into this interview, you made a conscious decision to lie right there. Play that again. You said, I was at the house. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. <laughs> I left the house. Who played it? You want me to back it up some more? Well. Yeah, we can keep listening to it. Anything around now? What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to... My mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover and okay. she fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. You want to hear it again? No, sir, but I, I don't well, think- You made a conscious decision to lie right there, this early into an interview, sitting in the front seat, correct? I don't believe so. I, you didn't make a conscious decision to lie. I don't believe that. I don't believe that was lying at that point. Okay. Tell me why not. Because Maggie had gone to the kennels and I was at the house. Okay. So you think you were being? That was not a lie at that point. I, I, I don't believe so. At, that at, point. What, at what point did you decide to lie? I'm not sure, but it was in that. It, it was, was in this interview. I believe that it was. Okay. Was well, this interview where you're sitting in the front seat, correct? It is. You're not in custody, correct? I'm not in custody. They're giving you water, letting you chew tobacco, treating, treating you politely, correct? They would treat me very politely. So what, what was it that, that clicked? When did, so you said it's this interview that it clicked that, I, that I'm going to lie about the most important fact that I know? I'm not sure exactly when in it that I lied, decided to lie, but I, I believe it was during this interview. I, I believe all those things that I talked about, uh, you know, those things that had gone on, the things that people had said to me about don't talk to anybody without a lawyer. Uh, my partners all told me that, or a lot of my partners told me that. My dear friend, Chief Alexander, was one who said that. I, I overheard. I believe it was Sheriff Hill. I'm not positive. I overheard him tell, I believe Mark Ball or Gray Holmes, don't let him talk to anybody without a lawyer. And what I believe is that based on my distrust of SLED and getting in that interview, and I'm not positive about this, but I believe when he asked me, you know, about my relationship with my wife and my son, I believe that's when I decided to lie. You but I'm not left positive. out when you had the GSR too, because that's what you testified to yesterday. That certainly contributed. And, you, and your dope paranoia too. You said that as well, correct? Well, those things are what triggered the paranoia that started as my addiction evolved. Right. And so 
you're an experienced lawyer and you've been a prosecutor and you took the advice of your law partners that you should have a lawyer there as you read that as, oh, I should lie. No, that's, that's not an accurate Because that's statement. not what that means, is it, Mr. Murdoch? Well, that, that's, not a, that's, you're not, that's not an accurate statement, what you just said, Mr. Waters. I just repeated what you just said. You said was one of the factors was your law partners, and now you're blaming Sheriff Hill, and, and Greg Alexander told you to, that you needed a lawyer before you talked to police, and you took that somehow as meaning I need to lie? No. As a lawyer and a prosecutor? No, that's what you said, Mr. Waters. Right, but I, then, I, how I, am I mischaracterizing it from your perspective, Mr. Murdoch? Because, because I think that's, that, that, isn't that what you heard? Isn't that what you just said? Excuse me. No, sir. That's not what I said. All right. So, well, say it again. I believe those guys were trying to help me. I believe they cared about me. I believe they thought that I was in a condition such that I shouldn't talk to anybody. Um, I mean, I mean, those guys had to prop me up, help me get myself together just to be able to go talk to David Owens. I mean, they were trying to help me. But before that, that was just one of the many things that I believe led to that situation sitting in there where those paranoid thoughts came to me. Them talking about not talking to anybody without a lawyer, Brian Varnado checking my hands, the fact that I got a pocket full of pills in my pocket. Uh, I was the person who found Maggie and Paul. My distrust for SLED, um, all of those factors combined and made me decide to lie. I also know him asking me about Maggie and Paul Paul contributed to that paranoia. All I'm saying is, I'm not disputing that I lied. I'm just saying at this point, you're saying I made a conscious decision to lie here, and I'm saying I don't think I made a conscious decision right there. Okay, so it's lighter? I believe so. Had you already had your GSR done at this point? Yes, sir. Okay. I had. And you already talked to your law partners and talked to and heard Sheriff Hill. Now you're blaming him and, and I'm not, blaming uh, no. Chief Alexander now as well for your lies. No, sir, Mr. Waters. Well, I'm you just not, added that one. You didn't say that yesterday. You just yeah. added that one. Please be given an opportunity to Would answer you the question. On the fly? Objection. Um, can you finish your last answer? Right. Mr. Waters, I'm not blaming anybody. I accept full responsibility for what I did. What I'm saying is what I believe contributed to me doing that and the reason why I did that. I think those folks were trying to help me. So I don't blame them. I think they were worried about me. Okay. I don't dispute that, but you're saying you took that advice as I need to lie. No, nah. what you're doing is you're isolating one single I'm not thing. I'm not isolating anything. I've mentioned all the factors. You've added some new ones, but I mentioned all the factors that you're blaming for no, your sir. decision to lie. That's not what you did. What you asked me is you said I took, I took my partners telling me not to talk to somebody without a lawyer as a reason to lie, and that's an inaccurate statement. That was one of the factors that went into a your series. To lie. Hang on, Mr. Waters. A series of events. All right, that caused me to have paranoid thinking, all right, and then I lied. All right, but at some point it happened during this interview that you, you crossed over. You're saying that you came into this interview intending to be fully disclosing to everything, and something happened in this interview that sent you over the edge, and you said, hey, let me lie about the last time I saw my wife and child alive, supposedly, according to me. I certainly didn't go into that interview, I believe, intending to lie. Mr. Okay. Waters, I wasn't capable at that point in time of planning anything or thinking through anything. So somehow during this interview, all of a sudden, those senses came to you to plan and do that? When I got 
to thinking in that paranoid way that normally, as I said, I mean, I could take a deep breath and make it go away. I never had a situation where it lasted more than a matter of seconds. That night, after all those things had happened, it, it didn't go away in a matter of seconds. And I decided to lie. Those are the uh, clothes that you ultimately gave to Dave Owen, is that right? Those are the clothes I gave to David Owen. At what point did you get, get, be able to chuck the pills you say are in your pocket? When did you do that? When I was in my bedroom. And you're in the bedroom? Yes, sir. Where'd you put them? I'm not sure where I put them, but ultimately they would have gone in my suitcase. So you, that's when you did it? Do you have a specific recollection of that? No, I don't. I just know that I took them out of my pocket. If we watch this whole video, you think you could, if we watch the whole thing, you think you can say, okay, that's the moment where our, my senses came to me and I decided I was going to tell this major lie? Mm, I, I, don't, I don't know that it happened like that, but I mean, I may be able to tell you some things that contributed to it. If we watched the whole thing. Yeah, we've heard that. I just want to be clear, though, at least on this one, at some point during this interview when you were able to plan your lie about this event, and you made that decision, and it, but it wasn't what we just played. It wasn't yet. It was some point after that. I don't think that's a lie right there. Is, is the reason why I don't think that it's occurred before this, because what I'm saying there, I, I believe to be truthful. And I know, I know this, I know for a fact that when David Owens asked me about my relationship with my wife and my child, I know that that played a role in that. And I believe that, and I may be wrong, but I believe that this was before that. You ever heard the expression, not telling the whole truth is the same as telling the lie? Sure I have. That's something you understood as a lawyer and a, and a prosecutor? Yes. All right. State your full name for me, please. Richard Alexander Murdoch. <clears throat> and it's going to be your last name, so I'll get it correct. M U R D A U G H. All right. And you go by Alec? Yes, sir. And date of birth, Mr. Murdoch? May 27, 1968. And a good phone number for you. 803-942-1227. And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Henderson. Okay. All right. Um, as I stated, I'm David Owen. And uh, Laura Rutland with Collin County, I'm a sled. I hate to have to do this. I understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't you don't have any problem yeah. with it. So you hadn't decided to lie right there, correct? I don't believe so. You told David Owen 
that you understood that he had to ask questions and you do what you need to do, correct? That is what I told him. Your Honor, this might be a good time for a break. Uh, One o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, addressing the jury, we'll break until 2.15. We we'll go to the jury room. Please do not discuss the case. Murda, you may step down. You're not allowed to discuss your testimony with anyone during lunch. Uh, and Mr. Griffin, I will address whatever matter you want to place on the record when we return. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. One second, before everybody moves. Okay. All right. One second before everybody moves. So I guess everyone can be seated. Yes, sir. We'll be in recess to 115.